Good morning. I'd like you to turn with me, please, in the book of Acts once again. Uh, we're picking up from where we left off, Acts chapter 16. I'm going to read from verse 16 down to verse 32. Acts 16, verse 16, down to verse 32. It begins this way, it says, And it came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination, met us, which brought her masters much gain, by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us mm -hmm. and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days, but Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. And when her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers and brought them to the magistrate, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison, and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prisons prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. And he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. And they spoke unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And God will bless that reading from his precious word to us this morning. Now, one of the wonderful things about the book of Acts is that oftentimes it gives us a lot of background to the New Testament epistles. So the next time you read the book of Philippians, you realize that Paul's writing to an assembly. There are elders, there are deacons, and it's just kind of a functioning assembly. They're a good assembly, a joyful assembly, uh, a very uh, committed assembly in many ways. And, and yet what we do when we look at the book of Acts is we get a glimpse of some of the individuals that made up the assembly in Philippi. Kind of personalizes it. See, when that letter got sent, well, Lydia would have been there. She'd be listening to that. The Philippian jailer would be there and his family. And a demon-possessed girl formerly would also be there listening. And so, uh, again, any assembly is made up of individuals, but every individual has to have personal experience of conversion. And we're all from different backgrounds. And it's interesting that as you look at these sinners, I suppose you could say that prior to conversion, well, Lydia was a tender soul. Remember, she, she was already at a prayer meeting. She, she, she was already tender towards the things of God, and she had a tender heart, a heart the Lord opened. So she was a tender soul. But then we think of that, well, that uh, demon-possessed girl, she was a tormented soul before she was saved, wasn't she? And then we have this prison officer who also, no doubt, was an administrator of justice in many ways. I'd say he was a tough soul before he was saved. And so what a combination, different personalities, 
just like our assembly, made up of different personalities, different backgrounds, but all delivered by the same Savior and by the same gospel. And that's a wonderful thing, isn't it? And so as we look at this chapter, we want to kind of focus on this Philippian jailer. And last week, we uh, last time we uh, spoke, we talked about some questions. Uh, where is he? And then we talked about another question. Where are you? Now we want to ask another question today. And it's the most important question a person can ever ask. What must I do to be saved? Oh, boy, there's no more important question than that, is there? And so it's really interesting about all these questions. And, of course, a lot of people in the world have questions. And the place to get the best answers is the Word of God. And especially to this question, what must I do in order to be saved? So we want to consider it together. So I want to think about the background, the lead up to how, how did Paul and Silas end up in prison, meeting this prison uh, guard, uh, jailer? How did that all come about? And so that's kind of the background here. And so it's, it's kind of a, uh, before we get to the main character, we want to look at some lead up here. So the first thing we notice in verse 16, it says, it came to pass as we went to prayer. Isn't it interesting in the Bible how many exciting things happen when people go to prayer? Do you remember already we saw Peter and John went up to pray, and remember they saw the man that uh, was lame. Uh, and so uh, uh, something amazing happened as they went to pray. And here again, something amazing is happening when they go to pray. By the way, could I say this? Things can happen in amazing ways in this assembly if we're committed to prayer. See, the, prayer is where things, it's a powerhouse. It's where things really happen. And uh, I'm glad we're we're back to our Bible reading, but we don't want to get slack on prayer either. We want to be we want to be faithful in both. They're both really important. And so they're going up to prayer, and as they go up, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. So they meet this this slave girl. Uh, she she was a slave in two different ways. Firstly. She has earthly masters who are basically using her uh, for financial gain. So she's a slave to them. They're kind of or her owners, but she also is a slave to an even more insidious uh, character, and that's the demon that possessed her. And actually, we could go into all the details. I don't like giving a lot of attention to the powers of darkness, but literally is a, a, a spirit of python. Uh, that's what the word means uh, is to do with uh, Adelphi and and, uh, you know, kind of all the all that kind of stuff. It's just it, we don't want to talk about those things. We want to talk about Christ. It's so much better than talking about those things. But anyway, basically, she was able to tell people's futures. She was what we would call a fortune teller. And again, uh, how did that all work? Well, it's because demons have been around a long time and they also know what people are up to. So they, they can get a, have an, a good idea of what's, what may be happening in somebody's future. And so it's not that they know the future because they only God knows the future, but they've got a lot of information at their disposal. And so that's what she did. And so here we are there, this girl, she's following them. Uh, poor, poor girl that is a slave twice demon possessed and and again it's isn't it amazing really that with all the so-called progress of so-called modern civilization that people still go to fortune tellers still people are still fascinated with the occult they write off christianity they write off uh, biblical inerrancy all those they write those things off and yet they're as superstitious as as anything and, and are looking into all these things and UFOs. I mean, you know, reject God as that's, that's imbecile. That's, and yet, you know, they believe in kind of these aliens and all. Amazing, isn't it? The inconsistency of the human heart. And so here they are with, with all this. Uh, the spirit world is still very active in our world. People are still curious to find answers. They're all looking in the wrong places, uh, looking into the to the spirit world and to the world of the demonic, all of those things. Verse 17, it says, The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show us the way of salvation. I just thought, when I first read that, I thought, wow, that sounds really wonderful, doesn't it? I mean, what a compliment. These are servants of the Most High God, and they're giving the way of salvation. 
Ironically, she's announcing about a salvation that she herself did not possess. But they're talking about the way of salvation. And so you think, well, what well, this is tremendous publicity. I mean, everywhere they go, this girl is going around saying, these are servants of the Most High God. They're, they're talking about the way of salvation. You think, wow, this is great. And yet notice verse 18. It says, this did she many days, but Paul being grieved. I mean, the idea is he's, he's agitated at this. He's really upset. And he turned and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that same hour. So obviously, it annoyed him that she was going around saying, these are servants of the Most High God and talking the way of salvation. And you have to ask yourself, why would that annoy them? And we also want to just say this, that actually the same thing happened in the ministry of the Lord Jesus. The demons said some amazing things about and true things about the Lord Jesus. Let's just look at some just for a second. And they're all in Luke. It's kind of interesting. Luke is writing this uh, book of Acts for us as he's moved by the Holy Spirit. And he talks about similar things in the gospel accounts concerning the Lord Jesus. Luke 4, verse 34 and 35 let me just read from verse 33. In the synagogue, there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil and cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace. Come out of him. And when the devil had thrown him in the midst, he came out of him and hurt him not. And again, he's saying some very wonderful things about Jesus of Nazareth. He's the Holy One of God. And yet the Lord Jesus tells him, stop it. <laughs> right? He doesn't want that. He doesn't want demonic affirmation of who he is. You see down in verse 41, the devils also came out of many crying out and saying, thou art the Christ, the Son of God. And he rebuking them, suffered them not, so to speak, for they knew that he was Christ. And of course, we know from James 2, 19, the demons believe. It's interesting. There are no atheists in the demonic world. They believe and they tremble. Mentally and emotionally, they're in full agreement. The problem is their will is not subjected to the law at all. But mentally, they believe. And in the will, <laughs> no response. But in the emotions, they tremble. They know that ultimately their demise, their downfall is in the hands of the Lord. They believe in these things. So why is the testimony refused? The answer is simple. The people of Philippi would have immediately lumped the two together. The message given by the slave girl and the message of Paul and his team, they must be in the same business. She's speaking well of them and she's Telling people their futures. Maybe, maybe they're all in the same camp. We don't want that, do we? Do we want that same uh, identification? Paul certainly did not want the pure and holy Savior and his gospel associated with the evil of fortune telling and all of that nonsense. Paul didn't want the gospel or the name of God to be promoted by one of Satan's slaves. So he cast out the demon. See, the problem is that Satan may speak the truth one minute and the next minute tell a lie. Sometimes he speaks the truth, right? He quoted scripture to the Lord Jesus. Now, sometimes he twisted it, but sometimes he quoted it as it is, right? Sometimes he speaks truth, but he always it's always an unholy mixture. Beware of unholy mixtures, right? Truth, pure truth, undiluted truth, uncompromised truth is what the apostolic testimony was to be. And they did not want any identification with fortune tellers or anything to do with the spirit world. She didn't want, he didn't want people thinking, well, she's speaking well of them, so they must be all in this together. You know, it's interesting how many false cults contain quite a bit of truth. It's this mixture is what makes them so deadly. And so that's why I've got to be careful. 
And we have to beware because Satan often appears as an angel of light. And so we've got to be very much on our, on our guard. And so <clears throat> just a, another thought about the demonic world. just want to say this quickly because it's very important that obviously there's something attractive about the spirit world that causes people to get involved somehow, right? There's a curiosity. I, I remember years ago, uh, my, my mom wanting to go on the Ouija board. And that was kind of a thing people did, especially after they had a lot of drink. They would they would want to do these things. And I remember my dad absolutely forbidding her to go near it. I'm so thankful that he did that. But there is that curiosity. And can I just say, please, do not allow your curiosity to get you carried away with the things of darkness. All I can simply say to you this is, the scripture says this, walk in the light as he is in the light. That's what we must do. Always walk in light. Have no nothing to do with the unfruitful works of darkness. Don't even let your curiosity get involved with these things. And be sure to know this, that light always casts out darkness. Embrace the light. And be very, very wary of anything to do with the powers of darkness. Do not get curious. Do not get sucked in. This world is real. It's dangerous. It's destructive. It, it may appeal initially, but when people get sucked into it, or oh, you think of this man in Luke chapter 8, the man with you know the, the legion inside of him. There he is in the tombs, cutting himself and, and naked. And what this is what it this is the end of it. He Satan does not look after his followers very well. He really doesn't. So we just need to keep clear up that kind of stuff. And in verse 19, it says, And when her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone. They caught Paul and Silas, drew them into the marketplace onto the rulers. And so the owners of the slave girl, girl got pretty upset when Paul ordered the demon out of her. Again, it just shows that they didn't care about her well-being. All they could think about was their profits. It's kind of interesting. As the demon went out of her, the profits left them. <laughs> their financial gain left them. Because that's how she was able to do what she did. And, and so um, as the demon left, so did the prophets. And you know what's amazing is that in the New Testament, there are two Gentile riots. And both of them here in Acts 16 and Acts 19 are to do with money. Remember in Ephesus, those that were making the little models, the scale models of the Temple of Diana... <laughs> They, they caused a great uproar in the city because they were going out of business. People were burning their idols, you see, and, and it was putting them out of business. By the way, don't you love the kind of Christianity that puts evil out of business? You know, when there's revivals, I remember reading about revival in the Hebrides Island. Every pub shut. There was no interest. Every public house still haven't opened till this day. Isn't that amazing? We want to be part of a Christianity that puts evil out of business. That's the kind of Christianity that we see here in the book of Acts. Uh, and, and it's tremendous, but of course, don't expect that the powers of evil will sit down and take it lightly. <laughs> in, in fact, what we see here is the powers of hell were let loose. One of Satan's emissaries had been stripped of his power, and he was very, very angry. You know, we think about the Reformation, and really, uh, all the, the upset about the Reformation wasn't so much Luther teaching justification by faith. What it was was that he was talking about indulgences. And indulgences was a, a gravy train for the Catholic Church. You know, getting your dead relatives out of purgatory uh, by paying large sums into the coffers of the Catholic Church. And when Luther began to teach that that was nonsense and, and, and all the rest of it, well, it, it caused great alarms. How are we going to build St. Peter's, this magnificent edifice, if we can't raise money in this means? And so it was financial that was the real heart of why the Catholic Church wanted Luther dead. Because he was a threat to their money-making schemes. 
Verse 20, and they brought them to the magistrate, saying, these men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city. Now, you notice they don't tell the truth about what's going on here. What they appeal to is anti-Semiticism. Now, remember, they didn't even a synagogue in Philippi. Remember, they were, they were meeting to pray by the riverbank. There weren't any men. They were just a group of ladies. There's hardly a Jew in town. And yet, obviously, these two men are recognized as Jews. Interesting how Paul and Silas are thrown in prison, not Luke and not Timothy. What, why, why were they selective? Why Paul and Silas? Because they obviously look like Jews. And so what they do is they appeal to anti-Semiticism, even though most people in town have hardly ever met a Jew before. See, anti-Semiticism, you don't have to have many Jews to be anti-Semitic. Again, the same spirit that was in this demon girl is the spirit that works in the anti-Semitic spirits that is rampaging through this country where we live right now on our campuses, in the media. The anti-Jewish sentiment is from the pit of hell itself. And so that's what they appeal to. And it, it works. And, and so it tells us that bringing them out, these men being Jews that trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither observe being Romans. You see, they were a Roman colony and they were so proud of their privileged position as Romans. And, and these Jews were threatening that and we cannot have that. So verse 22, the multitude rose up together against them and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. So they act in a very un-Roman way, like the Roman way would be to give these men a fair trial. But none of that business. We're, we're proud of being Romans, but we're not going to act like Romans. And so they, they order them to be beaten. And so verse uh, 22, it says, the multitude rose up and they come to beat them. And when they had laid, verse 23, many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Now, it's interesting that in the Jewish law, there was a limitation. 40 stripes save one. So 39 stripes max. On the Roman law, there was no such rule. So they beat them with many stripes. Paul talked in 2 Corinthians three times. He says, I was beaten with rods. You can imagine what his back must have looked. He bore in his body the scars of being identified with Jesus Christ, didn't he? And this is the first one that we have recorded here. And they, they and Silas, he and Silas, they basically, just like the Savior experienced from Roman lictors, they experienced the very same thing. And it says concerning the Lord Jesus prophetically that his back was like a plowed field. And they, and again, you wonder, by the way, at this point, I wonder if they're thinking to themselves, I wonder if that Macedonian call was real. Do you remember they've seen this man in Macedonia? <laughs> I wonder if they were wondering, I mean, are we in the right place here? After all, we're going to be beaten and thrown in prison and all the rest of it. Like, it doesn't seem like things are going well as we follow the leading of the Lord and the Holy Spirit. But remind, remind ourselves, when the Lord Jesus was led by the Spirit in Luke 4, he was led into the wilderness. The leading of God doesn't mean you're going to have a trouble-free life. In fact, it may lead you into some of the biggest trials of your life. But what we want to observe is how they responded in all this. By the way, I just wonder, Luke describes this, you know, and he's describing what they went through. He's not there. But you know how he probably knew? When they were released, I wonder who tended their wounds. Oh, by the way, they've got a resident doctor in their team, don't they? Luke, the beloved physician. I, I would imagine that he could tell the story in detail because he was actually there afterwards cleaning up the mess after these Roman lictors. And so, and no doubt as they're laying down that he's putting his, you know, kind of antiseptic ointment on their back or whatever he used back then. And their vinegar is probably what they used back then. 
And I imagine that they're smarting and he's saying, well, you know, trying to change them. But tell us about what happened. You know, give me the story again. You know, so uh, anyway, it's just my imagination getting carried away. Forgive me. But I, it's good sometimes to try and imagine what this must have been like to put yourself into it, really, and, and imagine these things. And so it says that this prisoner officer, the jailer, he's charged to keep them safely. And boy, he takes his job seriously who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison, made their feet fast in stocks. So their feet are in stocks, they've got bleeding backs, and they're in the inner prison. What does that mean? Well, it means that there's no window anywhere near. The inner prison means you've got no air circulation. It's dead. You know, it's kind of, and so there they are in the the, the, the kind of most miserable, you know, if there are good accommodations in prison, this is the pits. This is the worst, right? You, you, you actually no air circulation whatsoever, no windows, their feet fastened in stocks. And again, I just wonder, are they beginning to question the Macedonian vision? And, uh, uh, you, you know, I remember a guy, he was a missionary in Brazil that we knew quite well. And he talked about how the Yanomami Indians used to pull their bows and arrows back and then let them go and then catch them just before they hit the missionaries. And he said, he said, when you were when you were there and that was you, you asked yourself, is the Great Commission really great? You begin to think about these questions, you see. And, and so I wonder if they were thinking these things, but I suspect they weren't. You see, remember, they'd had a vision of a man of Macedonia. So far, the only people that got saved had been women. Lydia. She was on fire tyra. She went even from Macedonia. And then this demon-possessed girl. But now there's a man. Could it be? I, I'm not being dogmatic on this. I just wonder, was the Philippian jailer the very man that they'd seen in the vision? Because their response, and, and maybe their response would be this way anyway, but their response is an amazing demonstration of God's power. By the way, I think this section, I want to call it a demonstration of God's power because you have it in three different ways. You see it in how the missionaries overcome difficult circumstances and still praise the Lord. That is a demonstration of divine power. You see it in the earthquake. That's a demonstration of divine power. It's a very specific, almost tailor-made earthquake for this prison cell, it's incredible how detailed it is. And then thirdly, the demonstration of God's power in the conversion of a tough soul. Three areas where God's power is demonstrated absolutely marvelously in these verses. And so notice verse 25, it says, And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. At midnight, bleeding and chained, Paul and Silas have a worship meeting. Praying, singing hymns. The first sacred concert to be held in Europe was two missionaries singing in a prison cell at midnight. By the way, was God giving them songs in the night? Psalm 42 talks about that. Psalm 77 talks about God giving me songs in the night. God was giving them songs in the night. It says that the prisoners listened. You notice that? It, it says that the, the prisoners heard them. You bet they heard them. Now, is this the normal response of men who have been falsely arrested beaten and imprisoned what what normally is the response of men under such circumstances it's it's usually a pity party isn't it with a capital p like woe is me and and you know this is terrible and why am why am i in this mess and why these by the way we're a bit like that sometimes ourselves when things go difficult why me why am i going through this all this that's what you would that's the normal response this is that's the natural response of the natural man this is a supernatural response. This is divine power at work in the lives of these men. And they're, they're singing and praising God. <clears throat> Praises unto God. 
And so the prisoners, no doubt, were all ears. By the way, it says they're praying to God. And then there's this earthquake. Do you know what's interesting? This is the second earth-shattering prayer meeting in the book of Acts. Remember back in chapter 4? When they prayed, the place where they prayed was shaken. And now, here they are praying again, and there's another earthquake. Well, wouldn't it be something if we had a prayer meeting and it shook the walls? Well, probably the building would fall down. I don't know. But, but then we'd have an answer, wouldn't we? What we're going to do next? We'd know for sure whether to move on or not. But, boy, it, what, what a prayer meeting that, that there was an earth-shaking prayer meeting and a song in the night. Oh, how marvelous to see God's grace uh, in this. And of course, um, you know, when the Philippian believers would have got Paul's letter uh, where it said things like this, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. The Philippian jailer probably would stand up and say, yeah, yeah, I know all about that. <laughs> I've seen it in these guys. They're not just giving words here. I've seen it in their lives. This is real. You can rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And so, again, it's just, I want you to try and get the Philippian uh, epistle connection here, because it's just, it's, it's absolutely marvelous when you put the two together. Verse 26, it says, uh, and suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundation of the prison was shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loose. Now, I want you just to get this. Usually when there's an earthquake, doors don't open, doors close. Right? Usually people get trapped in buildings that collapse in on them. Like, that's what I'm saying. This is a tailor-made earthquake. This has got a design. This is a divine design in this earthquake. And the divine design is to open the doors and break the shackles. It's very tailor-made. Can God do things so tailor-made like that? Of course he can and he's doing that right here. It's amazing. And of course, um, the, the foundation of, of the, these events uh, would spur some great hymnology. Charles Wesley, I'm certain in his mind, that great hymn, My chains fell off, my heart was free, I rose, went forth, and followed thee. I mean, their chains fell off, right? This is exactly what's happening. And, and so th that picture, no doubt, would have been very much in his mind. So now we come back to our main character, this keeper of the prison. Notice verse 27, the keeper of the prison waking out of his sleep and seeing, see, by the way, he didn't hear the singing. He's so hard-hearted. This guy's a tough soul. He slept through the whole thing. An undisturbed night's sleep, even though a lot of injustice going on here, doesn't bother him a bit. He's, he's asleep. And so it tells us that there's a great earthquake, so the foundation of the prison was shaken. Uh, verse 27, the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing the prisoners had fled. Now, you ask yourself, why would he do that? Well, he knew what was coming. See, under Roman law, if you allowed prisoners under your guard to escape, you had to forfeit your life. And he knew who would do it. The Romans would do it. And he knew that they would do it in a way that he would suffer doing it. So he thought, well, I'm going to save him the trouble. I know what's coming to me. I'm just going to take it into my own hands. And so I'm going to just fall on my sword, basically. And that's what he intended to do. Uh, and um, he chose to, to end it all, to commit suicide. By the way, it's one of the devil's greatest, greatest tricks. To tell people, take your own life. And all your troubles will be over. Well, what a lie. Especially for an unsaved person. What a lie. Your troubles are just beginning. And so we need to recognize this. And, and, and yet it's amazing what happens next. You see, this, you know, this prison, it's dark. Uh, this man's the, the, you know, I'm sure he wasn't in the, the inner prison with them. And yet verse 28 says, Paul cried with a loud voice saying, do thyself no harm for we're all here. How did Paul know he was going to end his life? How did Paul know any of this? It's, we know it's dark because verse 29, then he called for a light. The spirit of God is able to prompt Paul to know what's happening. Even better than the woman who was <laughs> telling the future. 
Spirit of God knows everything, doesn't he? And so Paul cries out, don't harm yourself. I guess he knew that that's what a prisoner officer would normally do. Yeah. Do yourself no harm. We're all here. The apostle rescued an unbelieving prison keeper from harm, but he also is going to rescue him from eternal ruin. That man's going to be double, doubly saved in one night. His life is going to be saved, and his eternal soul is going to be saved. And so they're in the darkness, and they call for a light. And Paul calls out with a loud voice. By the way, you ever wonder, what, why did not all the other prisoners get out of there? Like the doors open. They're, they're all the chains are gone. Why didn't everybody just make a quick, great escape? No, we're all here. Do yourself no harm. Is God constraining them? Is it what they heard? that They maybe wanted to hear more about what these missionaries were saying. They'd never seen men act like this at midnight after what they'd been through. Maybe everybody just were, were wanting to stay and hear more from these two men. Because nobody's leaving. So Paul calls with a loud voice. Asked for a light. And so verse 30 says he brought them out. Sorry, he called for a light, sprang in, verse 29, came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas. He brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, we might ask the question, what brought him to this question? He seems so indifferent, like he went to sleep. But no doubt, he heard some of the details of the arrest and what was going on and what these men were preaching. And then and then the fact that um, uh, he, he, he now sees the miracle that, that nobody's fled and Paul is the spokesman. Maybe all of these things coming together are beginning to dawn on him that there is a supernatural power here far greater than any of my superstitious ideas that I might have had before. And so wh whatever the background is, he comes to this most important question that a man could ever ask. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? The man's already clearly under conviction. You, you don't ask that question unless you're already convicted. He's already under conviction. What must I do to be saved? He, he's already brought to that place where he knows he needs help. He's desperately crying out for help. And their answer is a very simple answer. They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. It's good to notice what Paul doesn't say. He doesn't say, well, try and live a good life. Well, you need to do good works. You need to keep the commandments. You need to do all the rituals of Judaism. You know, uh, you got to do this, this. And... No, no, no. He doesn't say any of those things. But he says, what must I do? And they say, believe. Interesting. We have to put our confidence in what someone else has done on our behalf. We can't save ourselves. He's done everything necessary to save us. When Christ hung and died on a tree to take our punishment... All that's left for us to do is believe on that. To put our implicit trust, that idea of believe, it, it has the idea of put your entire trust, rely completely on what Jesus did on Calvary. And notice he says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you might be saved. If you hold your breath long enough, you'll be okay. No, no, no. He says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved <clears throat> when we know that christ did enough that it was finished that there's nothing else to add we can rest securely for all eternity if we believe that he died there in our place simple gospel it's interesting reading various commentaries people do absolute gymnastics to get round the plain, simple meaning of this text. I read a whole article on why it doesn't mean what it says. 
by a man who claims to be evangelical. We don't believe a word of it. He, he really. Just going to give you a couple of supplementary stories that, that are interesting. Bishop John Taylor Smith was the chaplain general of the British Army. And when he appointed new chaplains, he would ask them a question. He'd say, you have a soldier dying. He's got three minutes to live. And he asks you the question, what must I do to be saved? How would you answer? Depending on how the chaplain answered that question would depend whether they got the job or not. See, when you've got three minutes, you don't need a long, convoluted explanation. <laughs> you need simplicity. This is simplicity. Horatio Bonar said this, Upon a life I did not live, upon a death I did not die, another's death, another's life, I stake my whole eternity. Isn't that fabulous? Now, before we, our time is gone, and it's okay. I just want to read you this conversion story of Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Won't take me long, but it fits beautifully with what we've talked about. We'll we'll pick up on the rest about them getting baptized and all the rest of it. That that can wait for another day. Spurgeon um, had lived under Mount Sinai since he was about five years of age. He was deeply convicted by the law. He he he, he his both his uh, grandparents were preachers. Uh, he he loved to play in their little offices and uh, in their libraries. And he would he he his reading as a child were Fox's Book of Martyrs and Pilgrim's Progress. And he he was convicted by the law, and he was miserable under conviction. He was a guilty sinner, and he knew it. And he kept asking people, how can I be saved? These are all evangelicals. Nobody would give him a simple answer. And so it seemed like it grew worse and worse from five years of age until now he's 15, 16 years of age. And the weight of the it almost drove him to atheism in despair. One day he's going around Colchester, in Essex in England, and he's he's looking for churches to get help. Somebody tell me what I must do to be saved. And and, and anyway, it's a snowstorm. He was planning to go to a congregational church, and, and snow got so bad, he turned into a primitive Methodist church. As he turned into that church, there was a man there. He wasn't the regular preacher. Uh, he was, uh, he was st standing in for the regular preacher who got caught up in the snowstorm and couldn't make it. So this guy stands up and he reads from Isaiah 45, verse 22. Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. This is what Spurgeon says, his own words. He had not much to say, thank God, for the, that compelled him to keep on repeating his text. And there was nothing needed by me at any rate except this text. I remember how he said, my dear friends, this is a very simple text indeed. It says, look, now looking don't take a deal of pain. It ain't lifting your foot or your finger. It's just look. Well, a man needn't go to college to learn to look. You may be the biggest fool, and yet you can look. A child can look. One who is almost an idiot can look. However weak or however poor a man may be, he can look. And if he looks, the promise is that he shall live. Many on you are looking to yourselves. It's no use looking there. You'll find you'll never find any comfort in yourselves. Some say, look to God, the Father. No, look to him by and by. It is Christ that speaks. I am in the garden in an agony, pouring out my soul unto death. I am on the tree dying for sinners. Look unto me. I rise again. Look unto me. I ascend to heaven. Look unto me. I'm sitting at the Father's right hand. Oh, poor sinner, look unto me. Look unto me. Some of you say, we must wait for the Spirit's working. You have no business with that just now. Look to Christ, the text says. Look unto me. The preacher managed to spin that out for 10 minutes. And then running out of anything fresh to say, looked at his congregation and picked on Spurgeon. Young man, you look very miserable, he said. Well, said Spurgeon, I did look miserable. 
but I had not been accustomed to have remarks made from the pulpit about my personal appearance before. However, it was a good blow. It struck right home. The preacher went on, and you always will be miserable. Miserable in life and miserable in death if you don't obey my text. But if you obey now, this moment, you will be saved. Young man, look to Jesus Christ. Look, look, look. You have nothing to do but look and live. And I did look, he said. I saw at once the way of salvation. I know not what else he said. I did not take much notice of it. I was so possessed with the one thought, like as when the brazen serpent was lifted up, the people only looked and were healed. So it was with me. I had been waiting to do 50 things. When I heard the word look, what a charming word it seemed to be. Oh, I could have looked until I could have almost looked my eyes away. Oh, he says, that somebody had told me this before. Trust Christ and you shall be saved. I hope that you've looked and lived. And I hope that you're ready to tell others to look and live. Point them to Christ. Point them to his finished work. Point them to the uplifted Savior. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. May God encourage us with the precious word of God. Amen. Our Father, we again just thank you for the power of the gospel in all of its simplicity to change lives forever. Oh, Father, how we're thankful that one day we'll meet Lydia in heaven. We'll meet this Philippian jailer and his family. And I'm pretty sure we'll meet this slave girl as well. But what a day that will be. And Paul and Silas and all the redeemed, Spurgeon and all the redeemed through all the ages who simply looked and lived. Father, we're so glad that we did it. But if there's one that didn't, or maybe that may watch this and laid a date, oh Lord, that they might look to Jesus, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Oh, what a wonderful word this is. We thank thee for it, and we glorify thee. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen.